This is John Siegel sharing 50 years of turning experience with you. And today we're working on a newel post. This is a photograph of a newel post that we're making. It's from a hundred year old house in Jamaica Plain, Mass. And there are about eight of these posts in the house. And they need one more because they're altering the stairway. So they need a newel post that matches this one. And as you can see on the newel post, there are these rosettes. And today we're going to start by making the rosettes. I have one of the original ones here. So we're going to copy this rosette. And we have the blanks already cut out. They're 15 sixteenths of an inch thick. And they already have a hole drilled in the center. And that hole is drilled right at the point where the compass uh, center was. Before we attach the blank to the lathe, we're going to put a little wax in that hole like this to help the screw go in. And we're going to countersink the hole a little bit. So as the screw goes in, if it puckers up the wood a little bit, it won't cause this to wobble on the face plate. So we're mounting this on a screw center. We have the screw center set up in the lathe. This type of screw center utilizes a number 10 wood screw. You can put any size wood screw in here, any length that you need, and the screw is simply attached to the face plate by a set screw which is accessible through that hole. To mount a workpiece, we pre-drill a hole depending on the length and the hardness of the wood. We pre-drill a hole. You need to test your hole size. Make sure you have a hole that's the right size for the screw that you're using. Get this on there. And as it starts to Go to the end. I'm going to lock the spindle and tighten this right against that screw pretty hard. As I release, the spindle lock will pop out like that. And now we're ready to turn. We have a sample here that we're copying. I'm going to put that right up here where I can see it really well. Start right here. Now I know that with the dust collector running, you can't hear me talk. So I'll shut off the dust collector when I need to speak and explain what I'm doing. So the first step is going to be bringing the outside diameter to the correct size. And of course, when I bandsaw these, I bandsaw them a little bit oversize to allow for irregularities in the sawing and allow for errors in the center placement. This is the size, the finished size that I need. this out, I'm shaping it into a taper, so it's smaller at this end. It only needs to be the correct diameter right here at the back edge. By turning it to a taper, it makes it very easy to check the diameter with the work running. And I can tell that where the caliper is fitting, right about there. So that is the diameter that I want, and it helps me visualize how much more I need to take off to get that to the correct size. 
And working it down as a taper is an excellent way of testing and correcting. Now I have the outside diameter correct. These have already been plain to a thickness that I know is correct, so I have that much to start with to help me get them all the same. Now this is a kind of an unusual situation in that I'm going to be roughing out with a scraper. And you might think, if you've read any of my articles, that I generally rough out everything with a gouge, but because of the size of the work, and the fact that the work is very flat, I can approach the grain from the front, from the face. When you approach the grain from the face, the wood yields very easily. You don't want to approach the grain from the periphery on a face plate turning because then you're running right into the end grain. I'm going to approach from the face because we know the grain is running this way. It's not running parallel to the axis like in a spindle turning it's running across the axis. So we're going to rough out with a scraper and here's a high-speed steel scraper. Should do the job very well. So here we go. If nothing else, you'll learn from this video that a scraper can be a roughing tool and a finishing tool. It just depends on the way you use it and the way you sharpen it. We're going to use the same tools for roughing that we use for finishing. You can see that in the roughing operation, the finish that we get is not very good. And that's because we're cutting very aggressively and we're taking some f fairly heavy shavings. But the very same tool, when used delicate, when freshly sharpened and used very delicately, can produce an excellent finish on faceplate work. And so now we're going to mark the diameter of this shoulder, which is a very key thing. And I have the calipers set to that diameter. But more importantly, I have these dividers set to that diameter. And so I'm going to mark the diameter with this. Now a lot of people have trouble scribing a diameter on the face of a workpiece. And the problem, of course, is that on this side, the wood is moving up. And as soon as that point hits the, the work, the caliper is thrown up. Away, up, away from the tool rest. And that's a very bad and a dangerous situation. Well, the way you do this is to never let this point touch the work. Only this point touches the work. 
And this point is only used to observe the location of the scribe mark. So I go in with only the left side touching. And as soon as it touches, it'll scribe a line and I can observe whether that line is inside or outside the other point, even though that point isn't actually touching the wood. I'll try to put my hands in a way that you'll be able to see. There it is. The right hand point isn't actually touching the wood, but it's close enough that I can see that it's located directly where that point is. And that's how you scribe a circle on the face of the work. Of course, I wouldn't want to use this as a radius because I'd end up with a hole in the center, which would be really hard to fix. So I'm scribing this as a diameter. inside corner is very critical, it's a very critical location that I need in order to make all of these rosettes look like the original one and all look alike. Now I've got the diameter correct, but how, how am I going to measure it this way in the axial direction so that I know that the depth this way is correct, or rather the thickness of this is correct. So I've set a caliper like this. And when this point's right at that point, I know that I'm the right thickness. So I'm about a sixteenth of an inch over. This type of caliper has one bent leg and one straight leg, like a divider. So it's half a caliper and half a divider. And the name for this type of tool, believe it or not, is a hermaphrodite caliper. Now what you just saw me doing there was using the square-ended scraper to round that curve. This is really an excellent tool for rounding the curve because this side, of course, isn't sharpened and I can actually push the side of this right up against there without worrying about catching because this is not sharp there. And I can get it right into the corner, and as I rock this around, it just gives me that smooth curve. And a lot of people make the mistake of trying to bring this tool all the way around to here. But you'll notice that I only brought it around about here, and then I stopped. And the reason is that as you come around more and more of an angle, eventually you get to a point where you're attacking the end grain. And the square end scraper is not very good on end grain. It presents too broad of an edge and it will vibrate and catch. So what I prefer to do is come around, you know, maybe to 45 degrees and then continue around using a round nose tool because the round nose of the scraper will present a narrower exposure of the edge to the end grain and works much better.
moment and show you. When I was deciding which tools to use, holding this scraper up against here, I could see that the radius of curvature of this tool is just a little bit too large for that. And so I got this one, which fits much better. So this is the tool that I'm going to use to make that shape right in there. And because the tool is just slightly smaller than the curvature there, this is really the ideal. And this will really, using the right tool, will really help me get the shape. In a way, I'm kind of using this as a form tool in that sense, that I'm trying to get a certain curvature that relates to the shape of the tool. the two and I'm going to compare them. I don't know if you can see very well. I'm comparing these nose to nose to try to see if I have the curvature of that central dome feature the same in terms of the width and the roundness of it. It looks very good to me. I'm just going to smooth that out just a little bit more. sand. And you'll notice that on the final cuts, the feeding of the tool very, very slowly is the key to getting a good surface. Of course, the key to getting a good surface is to have an extremely sharp tool. Before you make your finished cuts, you sharpen up right before the finished cut. When you're using a scraper for roughing and finishing, Obviously, your sharpening cycle would occur right before the finished cuts. And then you would do your roughing of the next piece and then go back to finishing. I can see that the height of this, the height of this is a little bit higher than that. I gotta make this a very slight correction there. going to begin sanding. So I have the dust collector on. I'm going to start with 100 and then proceed to 150. I always start by sanding in reverse. This is especially important on a faceplate turning because, and, and especially a wood that's kind of fuzzy like, like walnut. And I can feel that it feels rougher when I pull my finger this way and smoother when I go that way. That's because the grains have been laid down by the tool. So by sanding in reverse, that is going this way, I'm going to pick up those fibers that have been laid down and cut them off.
readjusted the camera so that you can see the dust going right into the dust collector. doing that is just to say that if you're still sanding without a dust collector, you better get one. You don't want to be breathing all that stuff. A lot of people have trouble sanding at center point on a knob or a rosette like this. When they're sanding, they always end up with a little point right at the center, a bump, instead of having a nice smooth roundness, which is, of course, very important on a knob or something. The way that you prevent getting a bump in the center is to make sure that the sandpaper is moving across the center all the time and not just holding still. The reason you get the bump is because the surface speed at the center is zero and so the sandpaper can't remove any material from the center. So you want to work across it like this and that'll prevent. I'm going to switch to strip. finished with a 100 grit and I'm checking to be sure that there's no there's no evidence of any tear out from the chisel and that the only scratches that I see are the scratches left from the 100 paper and nothing left from the tooling itself so now we'll use the 150 paper we're going to reverse direction because you always reverse direction after each grit. For the finishing touch, reverse direction again and just give it one last touch up. off of this edge, but you don't break the sharpness off of the back edge, not here because that's going to be applied to a flat surface.
And there's the finished rosette.